Hola, how are you? John, how are you? Very good. Now, listen, that's a different background. Um, where are you? I wish I could show you my actual background, but it's a little too, little too dark out there, I think. I'm in Paris today. Awesome. That's exciting. What was going on in Paris? Tell, tell us. So we had a group of um, CIOs and executives from a variety of different uh, organizations here in France talking about hyperscalers, the promise of cloud, how do you migrate? What are the pitfalls? What are the challenges? It was it was really a, a wonderful uh, breakfast that we hosted this morning um, with, a, I think, about 15. There were 15 or 20 um, chief executives of companies that uh, are all struggling, I think, in the same way. So it was really, uh, really great, insightful experience just chatting with them. Wow, that you must have picked up a lot of insights from enterprise clients that are kind of struggling with this. And it really leads into, we've got a couple key topics to chat about today. Hyperscalers is, is certainly the first one. So that's gonna tie in beautifully with your meetings this morning. Um, I also wanna make sure we spend some time on what's happening in high tech, uh, Twitter, uh, Elon Musk and all the excitement there, I'll call it excitement. Um, and layoffs in high tech in general. Uh, as well as M&A, and then some really big news on Monday with regards to LTI and MindTree kind of officially becoming uh, one business. So lots on the agenda for 28 minutes. So let's start off with the hyperscalers. What did you learn this morning? What were some of the insights around what CIOs were talking about? I think uh, let's just call it the continued um, challenge with the promise of cloud. Uh, cloud, I think... You know, and it's funny, we talk about hyperscalers. Uh, there's there's some understanding now that there was some hype to the hyperscalers. <laughs> um, I think a lot of organizations had assumed that there would be a path to migrate from on-premise data centers to the cloud in a relatively rapid manner. Yeah. Not that it would be easy and not that it would happen overnight, but they certainly expected it to happen more quickly, I think, than it actually manifested. And in, And in fact, for most of them, their business case for that move to cloud, while it had a lot to do with, uh, you know, customer centricity and agility and resiliency and scalability, while it had to do with all of those things, um, it also had a cost component. And we can't just say that it didn't. Um, yeah. And a lot of clients are struggling to see that manifest in their actual migrations. And part of that, I mean, there's lots of things that really impact that. But part of that is, you know, this, uh, again, assumption that I would reach the capacity that I maybe signed up with a hyperscaler to reach. Um, lots of, uh, lots of organizations felt like they were getting a really great deal uh, with a hyperscaler because they had these, you know, big discount numbers in their heads. Oh, a 40% discount, 50% discount when they reached a certain capacity course, the issue is that reaching that capacity is either so is either slow, slower than they expected, or they don't even see a way to reach it um, just because they've slowed so much in their migrations. And of course, new development um, is cloud first in most organizations. So when I'm when I'm looking at new ways of connecting with my uh, consumers, when I'm looking at new ways of enabling my supply chains, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, a lot of that development's happening on the cloud. So that means that my cloud consumption and the cost of cloud is going up, but I'm not offsetting it by removing some of that on-premise fixed cost that I still have within my environment. So it just creates a challenge. And I think, you know, a lot of organizations are recognizing that um, they need the ability to adjust business cases as they start to see the reality of value realization and recognize when things may go a little slower or go a little faster than they expect. And there's yeah, well, a, a lot to be said for that, I think, in, in that marketplace. So, Yeah, I, I think you're bringing up such an interesting point. You know, AWS, Google, Azure, they've had some tremendous year-over-year -year growth. This is the first year Stanton Jones put some information out on the index yeah. that shows some slowdown. Now, a lot of firms would fight for 27.5% growth year-over-year but that's actually a slowdown for AWS. And it's and so there is some of this sluggishness. And I think part of it's attributed to, you know, if you're a chiropractor, you're gonna recommend chiropractic for back injury, right? If you're a surgeon, you're gonna recommend surgery. 
And the challenge is, is that I think a lot of enterprise were very excited about the 50%, 40% discounts and listening to AWS and the dream. The challenge was, is maybe it's just not chiropractic. Maybe you do need a little surgery and a little uh, physical therapy, you know, as well. And I think that's where kind of some of the work that we do at ISG, it kind of folds in there is like, yes, chiropractic, but, or, and, Think about these other areas, even hyper multi-cloud, right? So maybe it's not just all AWS, all Google or all Azure. It's that it's that blending. So a lot of reality is setting in, it sounds like, from a CIO perspective. Yeah, uh, to the point of uh, recognition that hybrid cloud, which is essentially on-prem and yeah. multi-cloud, so yeah. completely hybrid environments is is more the reality. And and look, we we've done the I'll call it the easy lift <laughs> in many organizations. We've done the you know the uh, the workloads that we can uh, relatively easily lift into into a public cloud or even a private yeah. cloud environment. Um, the things that are left is as you say, it's those things that actually do need a little more work to them um, to get them into that environment. And then indeed, there may be uh, capabilities that don't need to necessarily go to that environment at all. And yeah. there's a lot to be said for taking a, I'll, I'll, I use the word commodity loosely here, but a, a largely um, uh, ubiquitous type of capability. I always use HR um, as an example where the way you do HR is very similar to the way someone else may do HR. Look, software as a service lends itself very well to that. And so rather than trying to think about how to take that on-premise HR solution and move it to the cloud, um, I need to be looking at potentially moving the solution itself out of uh, my own control and moving it to more of a, of a SaaS environment. So I think all of those things are happening at once, which can be quite confusing for the non-technical you know, business leaders who are essentially funding <laughs> funding what we're doing and looking for the return on that investment. So, you know, I think and I, I'd like to get your opinion on this because I was with a, a couple CIOs about a month ago in, at MIT. And one of the things that they were bringing up is the heavy involvement with the business with regards to some of this cloud work. Because I think if you just look at it as a cost structure component, it just seems simpler. But I think you have to think about the customer or the employee experience and the end result, and that requires kind of that leadership component from different parts of the business, CMOs, right, or CEO even at the highest levels. What did you talk about that at all this morning? We did. We had uh, actually had uh, a CIO from um, a major airline here who who spoke about um, the need for the business to understand where the money is being spent, but not necessarily, frankly, why. They don't care if they're getting their data from a mainframe in, you know, in in New Jersey or or getting it from a cloud that's maybe, no. you know, being run out of a data center in Poland or anywhere else. They they don't care. They want the data to be resident, available, resilient, secure, right? Yeah. All of the things that you want regardless of where you, where you want them. And so the promise of cloud that I think got sold to to the business is maybe where where we need to just back up a little bit, ensure that we have the right value realization practice in place, make sure that we have the right financial operation in place or FinOps in place to ensure and govern that what we're doing in all of our environments, whether they're cloud environments, as I said, or on-premise environment or what have you, that they're being used in in the most optimized manner. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like the gold rush. Um, everybody, we ran out west. And now the realization of, yes, there is gold, but we're all not going to become billionaires. And now it's kind of this realization of just chipping away and getting little pieces of value, right? Is that really yeah. kind of the analogy? Yeah, that's a great that's a great way to put it. And and the other thing I think, John, is you know, in reality, and I was chatting with a, another CIO this morning, and what she told me was, you know, there's a, a reality that that comes that actually happens to you when you wake up one day and recognize that uh, that plan that I had, even though it wasn't a like a detailed plan, but I sort of had this vision in my head that everything was going to go to, I don't know, some beautiful cloud somewhere. And it was magically going to be cheaper, faster, better than what it is today. Is The reality is that I need to 
inject a little reality into what I'm actually seeing in practice and adjust my business case to reflect it. By the way, some of that value is now being driven as an example in terms of being able to quickly develop very customer centric solutions in that environment and the speed of being able to respond to my marketplace and to competitive pressures in that environment is worth something. We wow. have a tendency not to place a monetary value on that, but there is a monetary value to it. And so I don't think it's that cloud doesn't present a promise. I think it's the promise we sold may not have been actually the best promise that it actually delivers. It is yeah. highly resilient. It's very secure. It's got a, you know scalability, all of the things that we had. I think it's got other things that maybe should take cost a little bit off the table as a replacement feature of cloud. Yeah, I think that's a really realistic way to look at this is, is cloud is here to stay. I don't think we're going to that's that's clearly not this is not the issue we're talking about. I think it's getting a better understanding of what that promise really is and then utilizing it in a more practical manner. And the good news is for managed services, you know, we've seen five consecutive quarters of nine billion and we don't see that slowing down in Q4. Um, Stan Jones talks about that as well. So that's kind of really encouraging with regards to, yeah, let AWS, Azure and everybody else worry about at, at the end of the day, cloud hyperscaler. But in the end of the day, our engine is still moving at a very nice pace, right? Well, and that's the other thing that we chatted about with this uh, group of executives this morning was the fact that managed service, it continues to be two things. One, the place where I can go for that expertise and the experience yeah. of what's actually happening so that I don't have to uh, think of it as you test the waters, that it's already been tested. Let me go to these, these folks who actually know how to do it. But secondly, they also happen to be the biggest purveyor of talent in the market. And so my ability to just go and uh, obtain the talent that I need to perform this work is difficult at best. I mean, yeah. uh, just we know that the talent, the war for talent or whatever you want to call it, hasn't really stopped. There's still yeah. a high degree of need for uh, talent in the marketplace. And we see that through a lot of different lenses. I think uh, Stanton's last, uh, last Index Insider talked about M&A and yeah. the potential that what we see happening in mergers and, and particularly in acquisitions within the technology market um, is probably somewhat and maybe even largely being driven by a need for talent and capability um, you know, that, yeah, that, that really is, that really is, a, it's needed. Yeah, you're bringing up a great point here. The M&A stuff is just so intriguing. We, we saw a 50% bump increase in the number of mergers and acquisitions, but those deals are significantly smaller. Much so smaller. it's not necessarily, you know, the idea of, of buying uh, IP necessarily. You're right. I think it was this idea of, of acquiring talent to fill in gaps. Is that what you're thinking as well? Yeah, I, th I do think it it appears to be that. And yeah. while we saw a slight, a very slight uptick in unemployment in the tech sector, and as you mentioned at the start of the show, we've heard things from companies like Twitter and Meta and uh, Lyft and other organizations that are talking about massive layoffs. But don't forget that during the pandemic, a lot of these companies really kind of went on a buying spree. Yeah. They had a lot of... Um, a lot of highly skilled individuals who were sitting at home, able to sort of look out into the ether and, and imagine what their next best job might be. And a lot of these organizations started that hiring trend. Um, I mean, good on them, but now they may be getting to a point where they really need to maybe right size a bit. Um, yeah. I don't think the market is going to have any difficulty at all sucking up those engineers and that talent uh, that's being released. I certainly don't see any kind of uh, real release of the demand. It may go down a bit. I think we chatted about this last time. There may be a tapping of the brakes that happens, but I haven't I haven't seen anything um, that would that would lend me to think, oh, we're, we're going to see a real slamming of the brakes, you know, in terms of talent. Yeah, I don't, I don't see a slowdown with regards to kind of innovation, but, but I am curious to see where the unemployment in tech goes. Um, you know, over so, almost 70,000 people laid off in 2022 in tech. 
Uh, that, and these aren't people that work competent, right? These are actually, like you said, highly skilled individuals. Um, there's more to come. You know, what was it? Zillow, 5%, Twitter, 50% of the employees, Amazon, 1%. Now, 1% doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a giant a number, yeah. right? So so even at the Amazon level, there's a, a, a shrinking and optimization around cost um, because there are some pressures, right? We've got inflation. We've got some other things that are causing some, some pressure. And frankly, when Elon Musk did this 50%, I almost think it gave an open license for other firms to tag on to that over the next few months and, and have that as the excuse. Like, yeah, tech is hurting. We're going to we're going to we're going to right size. Well, I do think that there's a couple of things to keep in mind. One is, I think, three or four years ago, if I went to hire a cybersecurity expert, um, I certainly wanted someone who might have might be certified. Finding yeah. someone with a, a real depth of experience was difficult yeah. because it was a new and emerging uh, technology, new and emerging space. So I tended to focus my attention on folks who had any experience, but certainly those that were certified. And because we've seen this uptick in certifications, by the way, that doesn't mean that the folks who are certified have the experience, but we now have three, four, six, seven years of experienced yes. people who are now being released into the market. So what you may see indeed is um, those folks having an easier time of it, uh, being able to, to find new jobs simply because now I can look for experience, whereas before, Gee, I was probably looking for anyone who could stick whatever, uh, you know, three or four digits on the on the back of their name because they were certified. Yeah, that's no, that's a good point. And then and let's go back to the M and A piece too, because again, this ties into the downshifting, but also people optimizing NTT data, right? They acquired MuleSoft's consulting firm, right? That's that's acquiring talent, right? That's that's a specific move, small, right? But specific move, you know, Accenture. Accenture requires somebody every six to seven days, right? Yeah. So they're they've always been highly, they've always been highly acquisitive. I think the thing you would look at and, and say with Accenture is um, they've often done that for capability, for specific capability they might not already have somewhere in their firm. Um, they got a lot of those things in their in their company now. And so now as they're acquiring, it does look to be more talent oriented because they certainly already have, as an example, engineers within their firm. So if they're purchasing or acquiring, um, you know, an engineering firm, then that kind of tells you that they're trying to beef up um, the talent that they have within that particular within that particular area. Yeah. And, and um, with with regards to lay, layoffs in the U.S., it's pretty easy. Like, you know, you get to send an email and say, good news, you're no longer working here. Um, but in Europe, it's it's really challenging. So do you think it'll be slow with regards to how people hire because of the concern about how they can, you know, easily let go people? I mean, what are your thoughts around that? I think that's a really interesting difference in, in the U.S. market compared. It's a really great question. And now I've been over here, you know, for a year now, actually, in, you know, running a business yes. in, in Europe, it is very different. I think it does actually lend itself to um, a much slower, uh, a higher bar for hiring and yeah. a slower process for hiring. I certainly look at that in a much different lens than I do in the US because I have the the right to hire pretty much anyone and the right, right to release them where I, I don't necessarily have that same uh, freedom um, in, in many cases, depending on what my hiring practices and my, and my policies have been. And so I do think that there is just a, a bit of a higher bar. Having said that, uh, the um, demand within Europe is as high, if not higher than what we're seeing in the US, particularly for those emerging areas like digital engineering, um, AI, cognitive. I mean, you see manufacturing taking the lead in the move as an example in the use of technologies in the cloud um, in Europe, whereas in the US you would see the financial sector taking the lead. So so you, it's interesting when you look at them, yeah. how, how they're sort of, uh, they change the way that they're approaching the market because of, of what they're actually dealing with in terms of the types of uh, uh, products that they create. You have a lot more industrial uh, creation, uh, value creation that's tied to technology, um, frankly, I think in Europe than you do in the U.S. today. 
Yeah, I, I think um, I think you're right. There, there, so there is a balance. There's a lag in some areas, but frankly, there's areas where they're more progressive in, in Europe, depending on what that industry is and where we are. But the agility yeah. of the hiring and, and releasing in the U.S., um, it just it's such a different paradigm with regards to. But but think about how that how that uh, impacts in the service provider market where you have service providers who have multiple clients potentially across the globe. Yeah. Much easier for them to uh, hire because yeah. they have much uh, less risk on their books of Ola no longer being needed because yeah. I could use Ola across all of these different clients across multiple industries that may be seeing different economic pressures, different uh, innovative uh, pressures as well, right? So yeah. I have a much easier time of being able to make those hires quickly because I can utilize them um, far more rapidly, potentially across those different clients in different industries than an individual client would who's in a single industry and, and yeah. is really um, you know up against the pressures in that particular industry. Yeah, that should give uh, manage, our service providers a real edge in the marketplace. For Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Um, one of the other areas I'm curious your thoughts on is, and I think it's having a major impact on M&A and even frankly, the layoff component that's been happening here um, is this hangover from COVID uh, for different industries. So, so look at cosmetics, right? I mean, you didn't buy, at least I didn't buy lipstick. You didn't uh, during, buy lipstick, John? No, during COVID. But, you know, a lot of people didn't. And so there was a, a huge, but, you know, furniture or things for the home, um, cameras for your uh, devices, et cetera, huge, huge unexplained upticks, right? So I was with a executive team of a luxury furniture company. And one of the things they're having to now justify and figure out is even from a supply chain factor is year over year. I mean, it could be as low as much as 50% difference with regards to sales in the 2020, 21 period to 2023, just because this hangover, what are your thoughts on that? Look again, the CIO I spoke with this morning is running an airline. You yeah. think they haven't seen some ups and downs and, and they have been rapid and they have been couched alongside of how do I use technology to innovate, to allow me to be resilient enough to be able to ride the waves that are up, ups and downs. And I think that ability to be very agile and flexible and be able to shift quickly is, is really going to be, I think, a key indicator that the markets are going to start really watching carefully. You saw, I think it was just earlier this week, you saw a couple of uh, furniture manufacturers who sprung up out of nowhere yeah. uh, in the middle of the pandemic are, they're gone. See ya. They're gone. They're bye bye, right? So yeah. there, I think there's, you know, it's it's very interesting the way that uh, you can look back and see the reasoning behind how something went well or didn't go well. Uh, but frankly, for a lot of companies in today's environment, um, I have no chance to look back. I have no time. Yeah. I, I'm expected to be agile. I'm expected to be resilient. I'm expected to make those changes and ride those waves. And unless you're a really large company who has uh, potentially enough, uh, you know, divestiture of product or divestiture of, of what you're uh, bringing to your customers. It's really hard to make those shifts, whether I'm in some, you know, in the cloud or not, as, as we were talking about this morning, almost doesn't matter. I still need a way to be able to be resilient and flexible and agile and move at the pace that the market wants to move. And sometimes that's really fast. Yeah. Sometimes that's really slow. So I have to measure my pace to the, the market. Is there anything that you think as you as you look, this was the, they call it the summer of travel because everyone was locked up for so long, right? It was huge travel. What will be, if you had to predict and just guess and no one will remember what we say, but what would be, what would be your prediction for like, what will 2023 be? Um, where will that surge be because of things that happened because of COVID? What do you think will happen? I, I don't see any slowdown. And and the reason why I say I don't see any slowdown personally is that, you know, I've tried to make some arrangements for my own travel a year from now. Wow. And I'm struggling. Yeah. Right. right? So it hasn't slowed down. Yeah. We see new travel companies spr kind of springing up. We see organizations who are looking for the ability in the travel sector in particular to recognize they need to scale. They need to go yeah. up in scale but they're constantly under this 
I think, recognition that, but that could slow down, kind of hit the brakes a little bit. And so I need the ability to slow down alongside the market. But for travel itself, boy, it, it seems to me like, John, everyone is certainly planning to come see me next year over in Europe. So maybe those plans will change. But right now, a lot of people are wanting to come and spend time in my tiny little flat in London. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. That's, uh, that's encouraging. I think we should be out there and we should be traveling and seeing the world. So hopefully that will be our trend. All right. Look at last topic here. LTI Mindtree, big announcement on Monday. I mean, we've known since, you know, the summer that this was going to happen. Um, what are your thoughts about that combination? So excited. I think a lot of us thought finally in a way, <laughs> right? Because they're so alike culturally. Yeah. but they have very different strengths. And so it's just almost one of those perfect mergers. It's one of the things where you say, there's not a lot of overlap except culturally. And that's usually the problem with mergers is culture. Yeah. So you have two very small companies, very small nimble companies, I would say, yeah. highly creative companies in kind of different industry areas that they focus on. You're bringing them together. So you now get scale on top of a, a really collaborative culture, I think, in both cases. Yeah, I, I think it's a real win. I, uh, you know, when the, when that whole piece happened four years ago and bringing those two underneath one hat of LTTS, it was kind of confusing, frankly, because they'd be competing on the same deal, and it, it frankly was almost distracting. And so I, I, I knew it was. It took time, but it, it just is such a nice fit to have the techno, uh, the, um, the engineering components of LTI combine combined with that customer experience expertise and mind tree. I think that's going to be a real competitive set. Um, not that they weren't before, but that combined piece will will edge up the market, in my opinion. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. And DC, I, I, I got to see him this past spring. And it, what a great leader to take yeah. over and, and, and be the CEO of that organization. I think it's going to be spectacular. Yeah, me too. Me too. All right. So what are you most excited about over the next two weeks before we meet again? Well, we have the Sourcing Industry Conference that's happening um, Monday and Tuesday in London for our, our service provider uh, uh, colleagues in the, in the industry over here. And that's always just an absolute blast. We get to share a lot of information, uh, see a lot of our friends uh, in the industry. So that I think that's probably the biggest thing that I'm looking forward to in the next couple of weeks. But I know you're going to talk about our show coming up in two weeks, and I'm very excited about that as well. That's right. Yes. I'm, I'm excited about two things. One is i um, absolutely excited about actually our Digital Business Summit on the 5th through the 7th in um, Orlando. So that's going to be amazing. I'm really super excited. Great, great attendance, uh, incredible sponsors, thought leaders coming. So that's going to be really good. Um, and then I'm also uh, super excited about Scott Taylor being on the show again this um, this in, coming up in two weeks, December 1st. And Scott wrote a great book, uh, Telling Your Data Story. And it's all about the idea of the importance of this data. As we think, Ola, you know, you, we talked about it is, you know, whether it's hyperscaling and moving to the cloud, taking cost, cost takeout, et cetera, the business is looking to how do I get uh, tighter to my customers, tighter to my employees. And it's all about that data and master data management. And so Scott can help us learn a little bit more about that. So I'm really super excited about that topic. I'm looking forward to that as well. Look, I happen to be a big believer in that in that data resiliency and my ability to harvest and monetize where I can that data or at least use it for the business. So I, I'm really excited to talk to him. Yeah, it's all the foundational work. So that's great. Well, look, this has been spectacular. Have a great time in Paris. Get a Thank croissant you. and all that other fun food, right, that you're going to enjoy. And then we will see you on December 1st. See you then, John. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.